Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this evening's event, uh, where we'll hear from uh, some of the contributors to the UN Economic and Social uh, Economic and Social uh, Commission for Western I Western Asia. Sorry about that. Yes, uh, as discussing the World Development Challenges Report, which has just come out. Uh, it's just available on the web on on their website. Uh, but you have the benefit of being able to hear from some of the contributors and, and people who've been involved in its production this evening. Um, I'll turn over to Carlos, who will introduce the various uh, speakers in a few minutes. But I just wanted to say I'm Laura Hammond. I'm the uh, Pro Director for Research and Knowledge Exchange here at SOAS. Um, and I uh, wanted to say this is one of the first, this is the first official event of the Center for Development Policy and Research which is uh, based in the uh, Department of Development Studies. CDPR has been in existence for a very long time. We were just trying to remember actually what year it was formed, but it was founded by uh, one of our previous professors, John Weeks, um, who some old timers may remember. Uh, and then for a long time stewarded by Terry McKinley. Um, and now has, is going through a kind of recalibration and a relaunch uh, with Jonathan Goodhand as its director and uh, Haben Hill as its coordinator. So it's great to see um, CDPR really taking the lead in, in terms of some of our thinking around SOAS about current development challenges, thinking critically around what we as a community at SOAS may bring to some of those discussions, uh, and, um, and also kind of providing a portal for the community to have access to this wider kind of debates that are going on within development globally. So welcome tonight, and I'll pass over to Carlos Oya, who will do the real introductions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to the launch of the World Development Challenges Report, um, um, which has been launched by the Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia. And I'm, I'm pleased to have um, distinguished speakers representing uh, the Commission and uh, other organizations within the UN with a long history of you know, working on, on many of these uh, questions. And um, the report is you know, particularly focused on questions of measurement. We present an index. Um, and I, I guess for our students, this is particularly relevant since this is an important topic in many of our courses, how we measure development and, and what kinds of indicators and indices are best at um, ranking countries and showing us progress or lack of progress. Um, so for that purpose, we've organized this launch, which is going to include, um, first, um, Khalid Abu as Ismail. Ah, Selim, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Selim Jahan will, will speak first. Uh, Selim is, is former director, very experienced for, former director of the Human Development Report Office of the United Nations Development Program, UNDP New York and the lead author of the Global Human Development Report, which you know, many of you know. Um, prior to serving this position from 2014 to 2018, he also sell senior positions in the organization, including director of the Poverty Division of UNDP. And before that, he held various positions in university, in government, as an economic advisor at the Planning Commission for the Government of Bangladesh, and he has uh, contributed to work and consultancy, etc., in other organizations such as ILO, UNDP, and the World Bank. Um, Celine has a PhD in economics from McGill University in Canada. Um, then we will have Khalid Abu Ismail from the uh, Regional Commission, from the Economic Social Commission for Western Asia. He leads the Commission's projects on poverty, inequality, and human development. From 2002 to 2012, he was the UNDP Regional Poverty and Macroeconomic Advisor in Arab States, and I think it was at that time there was a lot of collaboration with CDPR, notably with, with Terry, Terry McKinley. Um, and before joining UNDP in 1992, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> that's Selim, uh, that's um, and he, was, um, he has authored more than 50 technical papers and flagship publications including this particular, this particular report. And he holds a PhD in development economics from the New School for Social Research in, in New York. And then we're going to have also the contribution from Natasha Linstead from University of Essex, who has collaborated in the production of, of, the, of the report. She's a political science professor at the University 
of Essex, where she also serves as a faculty dean of education for social sciences. And she has published on books on authoritarian regimes, good governance, development, and democracy. And uh, her mo most important contribution was to the governance uh, dimensions of the development challenges report. Um, so we will have around 40 minutes for the presentation of the report and particularly the, the index. And then after that, we will have two discussants uh, joining from remotely via Zoom. Uh, we will start with our colleague, Amir Labdiwi, uh, from the Department of Development Studies um, here at SOAS. Amir is also a development economist and is currently a lecturer in the political economy of development in our department at SOAS. And previously was a Canning House Research Fellow at the LSE at the Latin American Caribbean uh, Center. Um, he has been working on economic development and diversification of resource-dependent nations, low carbon innovation, and industrialization in the context of climate, uh, climate change, and he regularly advises governments, international organizations. And last but not least, we have Sabine Alkair from the University of Oxford, Professor of Poverty and Human Development, directing the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, which is famous for its multi dimensional poverty index, and very well placed to, to comment on, on composite indices of welfare. And previously she worked at George Washington University, Hardware University, and the World Bank, and also holds a, a PhD in economics from Oxford. So we're ready to start, Celine. Thank you, Carlos. I know that this report has a lot of outliers in uh, different chapters, that does not mean that the part of the audience has to be in the periphery. So we are not dangerous. So if you feel like, come closer so that we have more intimate discussion on the report there. My job is simple. I'll uh, hand it over to Khalid uh, in a few minutes time. I just want to make five opening remarks. First, is it yet another report? And the resounding answer to that is no. This is a report which has actually focused on many of the challenges that the world is facing right now. This is also a report which is looking at those challenges and the development outcomes through a different and broader lens. And this is also a report which is looking at various aspects of human development and tries to expand our knowledge of frontiers on that particular topic. So this is a report, but not yet another report. The second point is, so if this particular report is very much anchored into human development, what are its points of departure? Where it departs from the traditional or basic human development paradigm? I think the points of departure are threefold. One, like the human development report, it looks at the indicators of human development from a quantitative perspective, yes. But it also looks at the human development dimensions from qualitative perspectives. So therefore, the school enrollment is important for this report, but so is the classroom size. So is whether the teachers are trained or not. So I think to bring the qualitative aspect of human development is something new and novel to this report. The second um, point of departure in this particular report is that it looks at challenges. Sometimes we look at development outcomes from two perspectives. One is achievements, one is challenges. When you have some kind of an index or measurement in terms of achievements, you are basically looking backward. But when you talk about the challenges, and tries to measure those challenges, you are looking forward. So therefore, that's the second point of departure for this particular report. 
And the third point of departure is that it not only looks at human capabilities in terms of life expectancy, in terms of education and knowledge, in terms of standard of living, but also has brought the dimensions of environmental sustainability as well as governance. So those two aspects are also part of the index that has been presented in this particular report. So from those three perspectives represent the point of departure for this particular report from the notional, basic, traditional human development. The third thing is that even though this particular report has been prepared by the Economic and Social Commission for West Asia, this is not a regional report. As you can see from the title of the report, it is a global report. It is the contribution of the Economic and Social Council, Social uh, Commission for West Asia to the global debate and global dialogue on different aspects of development. So it would not do justice to think that this is a regional report focusing on Arab states only. This is a global report of which the Arab states is a part. The fourth point is, when I read the report, and I advised the report too, so my responsibilities are also there, there are five key messages that I actually picked up from this report. The first, the report stresses that the world we live in is unequal, unstable, and unsustainable. The second message is that in this world, a significant portion of population are still in difficult situations, and in some cases, the situations and positions are deteriorating. The third, that we have made a lot of progress. We have impressive achievements around the world, and we should celebrate that. But at the same time, we must not be complacent because there are more works to be done, and we should take up those challenges and go for them. The fourth one is the environmental sustainability and climate change are not only environmental issues, they are development concerns. So they should be looked from a broader perspective. And the fifth and the final message is, unless and until we fix governance, we cannot fix development. My final and the fifth opening remark is, there is no presumption on our part that this is a perfect report. We do not have the arrogance of saying that our report has the last word or is the only word. It is not a perfection, perf perfect report. But we did not want to make perfection the enemy of the good. So therefore, the kind of the information we have, the kind of the analysis that we have done, we are very much conscious of their shortcomings. But this is the beginning. And this is an intellectual journey, an intellectual enterprise, where we think that people like you, our collaborators, our development partners would join for further research to bring it to the frontier of our knowledge. We also expect that the kind of the framework that have been presented in the report would be tested under different circumstances in different regions for the validity and the vindication of the framework that has been proposed. And it would be taken up by the researchers, the academics, to actually extend our knowledge and our frontier of understanding. So with those words, I think now Khalid will 
take over and this wise man would provide with us a broader account of what is in the report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Islam. Good evening. Um, thank you, uh, Salim, for these very uh, remarkable and, and uh, very pertin pertinent uh, introductory remarks. I'm really pleased to be here, SOAS, um, and um, in many ways uh, it's uh, also very pertinent to be here because this report uh, challenges uh, conventional wisdom on development thinking, and uh, there's no better place, I think, to uh, launch the report than from an institution that is very well reputed and very well known to do the same thing. Um, so, um, in, a, in a way, I think, um, our, as Salim said, we are not claiming that this report, this index, this work is, you know, the ultimate say has the ultimate uh, answers to very complex questions on how to measure development but it it does provide a, a contribution and um, is is also I mean Salim spoke a lot about the motivation but I, I would also add like three particular uh, points uh, that motivated us to uh, do this work the first is that the development challenges we face in the development landscape is very different than the one we faced uh, early in the 1990s when there was a lot of effort and of course Salim took a big part of it in operationalizing the concept of uh, human development and capabilities. And uh, the world we live in faces very different challenges. So it does um, pose the question of how can we adjust our measurement framework. The um, the other motivation is a regional one. If you were to take the uh, development indices out there, um, and uh, of course they all serve a, a very good purpose, but if you were to tell a development story of the Arab region in particular, you will see that our story is highly sensitive to uh, the choice of these uh, in indices. So, the, uh, for example, the Human Development Index uh, story would uh, would give a very brighter picture about uh, the Arab region than one in which other major issues such as governance and sustainability is taken into account. So our main purpose, one of our main purposes is to develop this framework because we need to then go back um, and produce an Arab development challenges report but armed with this new perspective so that we can factor in these uh, contextual issues, very important contextual issues like good governance and sustainability. And finally, um, we also want to, and it's part of our mandate, to contribute to global thinking. That's what regional commissions do. And in fact, we're part of the global dialogue that is taking place right now on how to uh, measure progress beyond GDP. So this, uh, in a way, is, a, is also a contribution to that. Um, this has been a report that took almost more than two years in, in the making, and it's uh, in addition to uh, the core uh, team members of which I'm part of with uh, two uh, uh, members, uh, Abdul Karim uh, Jafar and um, uh, Maria Hetti, and uh, very young, I should say, uh, uh, members. Uh, we also had two global advisors, Salim, and your very own Terry McKinley, nine contributing authors, 13 senior reviewers, 10 background uh, papers, technical background papers, all of which are online, and maybe scores of ex expert group meetings. So it, it really has been a lengthy consultative process. And if you see the way that we started, 
thinking about this uh, and how we ended, there has been a lot of thinking and rethinking that has went into this. So again, these are complex issues, very difficult issues, and measuring them is also very challenging. So keep that in mind. As Salim mentioned, there are three fundamental challenges that we think are facing the world today. Not just the Arab region, but all regions, developing be they or developed. One is to go beyond the basic human development achievements uh, and factor in quality issues. So quality of health, quality of education, and quality of income, uh, which is, of course, conceptually problematic, more conceptually problematic and, and difficult to measure. And then there's the environmental sustainability challenge, and of course there's the good governance challenge. We wanted to follow the same spirit of the Human Development Index and keep it simple. So what we're doing is we're keeping a simple arithmetic averaging aggregation method in order to be able to show the contributions of all of the dimensions and sub-dimensions. And this is basically uh, the DCI, the Development Challenges Index, that uh, uh, we are basing our narrative on. Uh, essentially, we have three challenges um, that are broken uh, down into seven uh, dimensions. So uh, with the quality adjusted human development challenge, it's the elements of the human development index, but adjusted for quality. So we have healthy life as, uh, an, in, as an indicator, and we have also quality adjusted edu education, and we adjust for education using the international test scores. And we have the quality of income. Now, of course, um, the best way for you to, to measure the quality of income would be to ask, well, you know, what is it that really matters from income? And the answer, the best answer that we can give is that if it leads to poverty reduction or poverty eradication. But we, don't, we didn't have a good way to discount income using that measure. So the second best option was to use the inequality uh, measure, uh, the Atkinson measure uh, used by UNDP in order to discount income. But in a revised version of the report, because we've managed to answer this challenging question, we'll use actually the ESQA poverty index. But that's another separate technical discussion I don't think we'll have time to go into today. Environmental sustainability has two parts. One, which is the um, quality of uh, the environment we're living in, environmental health, and that's uh, taken from the Yale Index, and it measures basically issues like air quality and you know access to water and sanitation, all of which, by the way, are correlated with income. Um, so, uh, but these are the factors that affect healthy life. So they were chosen deliberately because of the link they have with healthy life. So your healthy life index is, in a way, correlated with these particular factors, and one can argue, of course, caused by them. And then you have the climate change and energy, which is something that is fundamentally important. Um, and that's uh, no, you know, uh, perspective on sustainability can have, uh, you know, um, a measure without including that. And in that aspect, we're looking at material footprints and we're looking at energy efficiency. So that's basically the, uh, the, the, the two fundamental sub-dimensions we're looking at here. Governance has been the most difficult one to argue for. And uh, we, after lengthy debates and back and forth, and uh, Natasha can speak a lot more about that, we've decided to have two aspects, two fundamental aspects. And one, which we are uh, all in agreement on, is the demo what we call democratic governance. And it's things like your access to justice and rule of law and, of course, uh, accountability and participation. These are the fundamental aspects I think we are all agree on. Why not other indicators and not why not other uh, sub-dimensions like corruption uh, uh, or human rights indicators? Uh, because we believe that if you have those three right, everything else will follow. That's, again, a pre-analytical position, um, which is very important. And I'm glad that Sabina, my friend uh, uh, Sabina, is here because she will always tell you that when you're designing indices, what matters is your normative positions and your 
pre-analytical framework, so, and, and, and that's ours. So. But there's also another part of the story, which is how effective are your gov governments? You know? are, are they delivering on good quality public services or not? And that's a very important part of the story as well. So both of these are, are also taken into account in, in our definition of, of governance. Um, as any index would be, it's, uh, you, know, you have to explain the categories in scoring. We have five categories, so uh, we have an extra category on top of your typical uh, human development index narrative. We have uh, scores that are below 2.2, are considered to be uh, very low in terms of the DCI level of challenge. Um, scores that are between 0.2 and uh, 0.3 or 0.299 uh, to be more precise are considered to be low, 0.3 uh, uh, to 0.45, uh, 0.449 are considered to be medium, 0.45 to 5, uh, 0.549 is a high challenge and anything above 0.55 is considered to be a very high challenge category. Um, this is the flip side of the human development index. So we're measuring challenges here. So the higher you are, the closer you are to one, the more challenged you are. The closer you are to zero, the implication is you don't have challenges. No? So uh, now I get into the results. Um, um, essentially, I think we have four, four main um, Messages, and I think uh, Salim has alluded to to some of uh, some of the most important ones. Now, as expected, um, the most challenged region in the world is Sub-Saharan Africa, with a score of 0.553. So it exceeds the you know the the very high category. So Sub-Saharan Africa is, in that sense, uh, a very high the challenged uh, region on the DCI, and the least challenged is North uh, America at 0.249 which puts it at a low uh, DCI level. The interesting thing is that none of the regions are at um, you know, um, a, a very low uh, level, okay? So none of them are before, below the 0.2, which basically means that when you factor in all of these uh, uh, dimensions and additional uh, uh, sub-dimensions, you, uh, you still have a lot to go. I still have a lot of work to do uh, in, in, in order for you to reach the um, uh, very low uh, category of uh, human development. The world itself, on average, is at a 0.437, so it's at uh, upper medium level, closer to the higher level challenge. And if you uh, were to tell the story of over time change and start in the year 2000, you will see that there's only been a slight decline in the global uh, DCI. That speaks of the sluggish nature of uh, the index. Um, and now, um, not all regions obviously have moved at the same uh, pace. In fact, not all countries have witnessed an improvement in the DCI. There are 11 countries that saw a regression in their DCI values. Many of them uh, are actually from the Arab region and two are from uh, Latin, uh, Latin America. In terms of the contributions, uh, governance has overtaken uh, sustainability as a larger, largest contributor to the DCI in, in the year um, 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 2020. So, um, but, but there's a very important issue here, which is if you look at the relative contributions of uh, the dimensions, you'll see that there's a relatively equal distribution, uh, which again speaks to the fundamental importance of um, all of these uh, uh, dimensions. Um, now, moving, I guess, a bit more quickly, um, one of the other important issues that we wanted to highlight was that um, nearly 50% uh, of the world's population is living in either challenged, uh, highly challenged, or very highly challenged uh, uh, countries. And that's, uh, that's a very different narrative than you, the one you get from using other indices out there. And less than 5% are living in very low challenged countries. So um, there's a significant level of challenges, Celine uh, mentioned. We are living in a very 
um, difficult um, uh, in, uh, environment and developmentally. And the progress that was done over time was uh, almost entirely, I would say, but not entirely, but uh, mainly due to China. So China's move from the very uh, highly challenged uh, to highly uh, uh, medium challenge category has really significantly affected the population distribution. Now, again, uh, going into the, um, the indices contributing to the DCI, education is still the most important uh, contributor to the quality adjusted um, uh, human development index. And we can see that um, there has been progress across the board, uh, but um, um, it's, uh, it, it's still, um, you know, even North America um, and Europe. And, and of course, I, I know that one of the questions and comments would be, why did we mix uh, Europe with Central Asia? And um, we can uh, talk about that uh, uh, afterwards. But, um, but Europe and, and, and Central Asia and North America are still not there in terms of the uh, very low level of uh, development. So even with those regions, there's still a lot of room for improvement. I think that is really a very important message. When you adjust human development achievements for quality, you can see, you can begin to see that uh, there's still a lot more work to be done, especially in the educational uh, uh, component of it. Um, the health part is the least contributor to this uh, quality adjusted human development index and then the income uh, uh, inequality adjusted uh, component is, is, is um, the second highest. Environmental sustainability is um, mainly uh, challenged in, in, in its um, um, access to environmental health and environmental health indicators are the ones that are uh, more uh, having a, a more important contribution and that also resonates with uh, the message that you still have a lot to do on reducing po pollution and access to basic water and san sanitation in most of the developing region, except of course for um, the richer North uh, America and uh, Europe, where you can see that the climate change indicators are uh, the ones that are contributing more to the environmental sustainability index, and that's expected and because this is where uh, you know you have the energy efficiency and carbon footprint uh, indicators, and the European countries obviously uh, lag behind on those. Governance is the most pressing. Um, challenge as we've mentioned before and particularly in the Arab region where it's um, lagging significantly behind so in a very highly challenged uh, uh, region and globally this is the only challenge where we've actually seen a deterioration so all of the others have improved with the exception of of governance um, in fact we, we can see a population jump from the, if you put together the countries that are highly and very highly challenged and look over time, you've seen a jump from about 3.6 billion to around 4.7 billion in 2020 over the period from 2000 to 2020. Commensurately, we've also seen a decline in the population uh, 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 living in countries that are very, uh, uh, have very low challenge on, on this particular uh, dimension from 780 um, million and, and they were initially two, 294 million. So that's, um, you know, fundamentally uh, alarming that, you know, we're, we're living in a world where governance uh, indicators are deteriorating and when you look at the conflicts that are happening and we know that governance uh, is a major contributor to conflict. That's something to also be taken into account. What to do? Um, so these are, you know, as I said, the main findings. And now the question is what to do. Well, obviously, we need to strengthen, the report has four key messages. Obviously, you need to strengthen the link between environment and, and, and health. And COVID is, of course, a, is a very good example of, uh, you know, the need to, to do so. Um, but, um, but the question is, you know, how, how do you do that with the current pressures you have on fiscal limitations you have in many countries on health systems? 
Um, so that's why the second uh, recommendation is uh, that you need to build more resilient economies and economies that are able to adapt to uh, technological change and, and uh, you know, the industrial revolutions that are taking place. So that's another major recommendation. And of course, the labor markets are fundamental because that's how you are, are able to uh, build resilience at the household level as well. So that's our um, uh, second more and, and very important um, uh, policy message. And then, of course, the uh, government effectiveness um, and uh, democratic governance nexus is, is also equally fundamental. We don't, we take the position that there need not be an authoritarian bargain. Uh, countries don't need to either have uh, good democratic governance or, uh, you know, good public service delivery and government effectiveness. You can have both. And, and in many parts of the world, it's been put as, as a trade-off between those two uh, fundamental elements when we don't think that uh, to be true. And there are many countries in the world that demonstrate that this is possible. Nordic countries, for example, are uh, leading on, in terms of their government uh, governance indicators. And the last but definitely not least, um, our main message here is that when you flip the order of um, and, and the spectrum, the analytical spectrum, to focus primarily on the most developed and most uh, challenged uh, countries in the world, then uh, it becomes clear that there's a lot to be done. And the fundamental uh, um, uh, recommendation, therefore, will be to prioritize those countries. And particularly, uh, you know, the, the countries that are going through conflict, like Yemen or, uh, and Globally, uh, you know, Haiti is also one of uh, the, the, the highest score on, uh, on the DCI. So these are our policy uh, recommendations. And now, uh, I just very briefly, I don't know how much time I have, but just very briefly, two minutes. Two minutes. I want to show you some correlations that matter when you, when you do the number crunching and you, uh, you, you, you plot uh, quality uh, adjusted human development against the variables that are, are is presumed to influence it, you see that there's a very strong correlation between its performance and between things like health system capacities that is fundamentally made out of doctors uh, to population ratios, nurse to population ratios, and access to public service. And so these are, uh, and the same thing happens when you uh, do the quality adjusted education, you look at the pupil teacher ratio. So these are fundamentally important for the performance of that indicator. With the uh, environmental sustainability uh, uh, indicators, we see a, a, a you know a conundrum here that uh, we I think we're all aware of that there's uh, you know uh, climate change indicators positively correlate with income, and uh, environmental health indicators uh, negatively uh, uh, correlate with income. So basically, uh, you 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 have a lot of the pollution is being uh, generated by developed countries and, uh, and many of the poorer countries are living in poor uh, environments and paying the price for that in poor, poor health. And that's the political economy I think that we are seeing in a lot of the discussions, including in the COP uh, forthcoming in, uh, in, in uh, Sharm Sheikh, we'll have to uh, uh, the, you know, speak to the heart of these issues. Human development and governance is a very important nexus. Our insight is that um, it's, it's very convoluted, it's a very intricate relation. But once you get to a certain threshold of good governance or human development, then the relationship becomes a lot more straightforward. So if you get, once you get to a point three or a medium, once you exceed you know, that medium level of uh, governance, then you see the relationship is a lot more linear, a lot more understandable. But before that, there's a lot of noise, a lot of fuzziness. In other words, there are many pathways to uh, the relationship between the variety of uh, uh, relations you can think of uh, between governance and human development. And we have to bear that in mind that, you know, this is a, a part of, uh, you know, the main stylized facts we know about, um, uh, about that relation. Why that is, is of course, a subject for a uh, uh, more lengthy debate. Another one of our main uh, debates that we had is w whether or not to include uh, human rights in the, uh, because it's closer to the, the framework of uh, human development. 
And as I said, uh, when you look at the relationship between the governance indicators and the outcomes on human uh, rights, you see a very close uh, correlation. So we prefer to stick to the fundamental drivers, and, and, and that's you know the rule of law, access uh, to uh, justice, and uh, participation, and voice and accountability. One minute, uh, I want to speak to uh, our current agenda, um, because this is how we want to translate all of this in, 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 in terms of policy action. So uh, when we take all of this work and we go down at the, the country level, we want to uh, focus on the inequality drivers in these challenges. So it's not uh, just about the averages, it's going beyond uh, the averages. And, and the second message, of course, is how do you build resilient economies? Those are our two fundamental uh, um, uh, you know, preoccupations, at, at, and there, we're doing a lot of technical work. So we're zooming in uh, on the inequalities by proposing and developing inequalities index focused around the same uh, dimensions of the DCI. And the initial results are also showing um, very interesting uh, correlations in between this inequalities in development, uh, which is capturing all kinds of inequalities, or vertical inequalities, horizontal inequalities, or inequalities in opportunities, inequalities in outcomes. And we're very um, excited to, uh, to be going down that path. But again, due to time limitations, we won't be able to get into the technical de details. Building resilient economies, we're also trying to look at the relationship between uh, what is a resilient economy, a real economy, financial sector, uh, resilience, and, uh, and uh, the, uh, the DCI. And we do see some interesting results, but maybe, you know, when you get uh, results uh, like um, that point to the, the fact that you have Kuwait and Japan at the same level of resilience, uh, or Saudi Arabia, you, you have to start re-examining whether this uh, makes sense or not, even though we know that uh, uh, lately with, uh, with the oil uh, 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 surpluses that uh, there has been more uh, fiscal uh, space for many of the oil wealthy countries. Finally, um, our future agenda is to contribute, as Salim said, to the global thinking. We have an Arab Development Challenges report coming up, but we also want to take this at the national level. And so uh, we are inviting countries to also take this work and to tailor development challenges indices at the national level and they can you know decide on which variables matter more and which dimensions sub dimensions matter more so that's an important part and we're very excited um, to to push that work at, at that level uh, my last slide is that you can visit uh, our uh, our dci website and you can look at the background papers there are 10 papers and we also have an esqua index simulator that basically allows you to see the impact of any country's performance on you uh, on the over any indicator performance on the overall rank and score change, which I think uh, will be very uh, interesting for many of the students. Thank you, and I apologize if I've taken a little bit more time. May I call Natasha? Hi, thanks again for having me. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, for me, there's a little bit of an echo. Um, so apologies to those that are listening over Zoom. So it was a great pleasure that I got the chance to work on this development report. And uh, so nice to work with Khalid and, and also Salim on this. Uh, I would agree with Khalid that the most challenging aspect was measuring governance. And we had lengthy and healthy debates on, on how we're we going to do this. Uh, and there was a lot of back and forth about should we go this way or this direction. And we did end up deciding that there wasn't a perfect um, set of indicators that we could land on, but we chose the best ones that we could given the, the framework that we were working with. And we felt that it was really important to take into account democratic governance, even though this was really difficult to measure. Uh, so this governance index is not just measuring outputs or results or outcomes, but is also measuring processes. And, and that made it trickier in some ways because we had to deal with some perceptions data. 
But as Salim and Khalid said, the, the emphasis on governance is really important to the report because it's so intimately connected with all kinds of other problems, whether it be conflicts or that it leads to more coups or, or greater levels of poverty. And um, so, so we took it very seriously how important the role of governance is. Now, what you will notice with the index and the way that we were measuring uh, governance is that what we're bringing in I asked to unmute. I don't know if that helps a little bit. Uh, don't have an indicator of elections. There are many, many countries in the world that hold elections and they're not democracies. Um, we focused on other indicators that we thought were really important to democratic governance. Uh, and so this includes uh, aspects related to the rule of law uh, and access to justice um, and, and institutional accountability. And as part of institutional accountability, I was really interested in looking at personalism. Uh, in particular, we were really interested in looking at personalism. And, and so one of the indicators is executive oversight. And we also look at judicial accountability uh, and then also rigorous impartial and public administration. But an additional thing that is important to good governance is of course participation and particularly bottom up, bottom up style participation. Uh, and so that's where we brought in indicators of CSO, civil society organization consultation, and, and just the overall participatory environment. And, and so these were important processes that we thought were, were important to, to capturing good governance. And then we added to that this governance effectiveness uh, index um, that, that looked at the, the outputs, the quality of some of these services, whether it be infrastructure or just public service delivery. And you can see in some of the examples that we have in, in the in the chapter and just throughout the report how important good governance is. Uh, we see that one of the biggest movers was was Georgia uh, from 2000 to, to 2020, and in the late 1990s it was essentially a failed state. Uh, and so there were some huge improvements that were made uh, in order to improve the quality of its institutions to reduce corruption levels. Uh, reduce personalism, uh, and which were instrumental to to resolving some of the, the conflicts with the breakaway regions there, and just to improve its overall levels of development. Uh, but many countries around the world, including Georgia, face many challenges from growing levels of personalism. Uh, and I, I emphasize this again, be, because in this big wave of autocratization that we're facing, um, this seems to be connected very closely with, with poor governance. Uh, and, and that has a huge impact on a host of other outcomes that, that are really, really critical to development. Uh, so I, I think I can stop there. I, I don't wanna go over time. Um, I just acknowledge that while the governance section, it, it had its issues, there was no perfect way to measure it. We were really keen on bringing this into the development index and into, into measuring development. Uh, and we see it as incredibly important. Uh, and it's a little disheartening that things aren't going so well for much of the world as our report indicates, um, but it shows how important this is to be at the top of the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Good. I think we're right on, on time, 40 minutes as, as planned, uh, which is great. Now we're going to move to our two discussions, and we will start with uh, Amir. Shall I go ahead? Yes, please, Amir, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Super. Uh, no, thank you very much for, for such an insightful presentation. Uh, you know, they say statistics are the lens through which we see and understand the world. So this work is, is in particularly valuable at helping us uh, unpack more clearly the how to measure uh, development and, and capture its multidimensionality. And that's a very important step in order to 
um, inform policy actions, right? More targeted uh, and uh, and more effective. So I wanted to start by by praising right, the, the 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 clearly valuable effort that has been done. Uh, I know I'm, I'm sure Sabina will talk a lot more on the multidimensional approach of, of poverty. So 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 uh, I won't cover that, but I, I wanted to particularly talk about the effort in capturing the quality of, of, of development outcomes, but also the environmental aspects, right? These are two uh, parameters that, you know, in recent years, there has been index, indices trying to capture it, especially the inequality adjusted HDI, but also the sustainable development index by Hickels. But this development challenge index takes one step forward, right, in terms of bringing those different worlds together and giving a better picture. Um, in terms of the environmental part in particular, uh, I wanted to raise the issue of, of how resilience is measured. Uh, so I've noticed that you know, one thing in particular which differs from similar indices is the, is the fact that uh, it's uh, green, uh, CO2 um, per capita is measured in terms of production, right? Not just in consumption. Uh, and it leads to asking the question in terms of whether have you basically thought or distinguishing in terms of the environmental challenge, both the, the, the challenge of the contribution to climate change and the challenge of uh, being affected by climate change. Obviously, you already have those two indicators of climate change index, but also environmental health index. But what about within the climate change one, thinking about the adapt, adapt, adaptation versus mitigation, right? Those who contribute to greenhouse gas emissions, but also the, the, the vulnerability to it, uh, which I think is considered in the uh, economic part, but I thought it would be particularly useful to have these two highlighted. Um, and in terms of governance, one question that I wanted to raise is, uh, obviously it's, it's very valuable to have this effort kind of capturing the government governance challenge. But to what extent is governance or good governance a outcome of development or is it part of the process, right, of addressing these different challenges? Um, and perhaps, and, and those graphs uh, at the end of the report are particularly insightful. And I was wondering whether it's, it's also possible kind of to keep kind of you know, pushing this work uh, to do something a la Mushtaq Khan, which is also part of, of, of SOAS, um, where, you know, kind of looking at how countries move over time and whether it's good governance that comes first and then the other development challenges get resolved as a consequence, or is it the other way around that kind of good governance is also uh, a part of the process of resolving those, those challenges? Um, and then in terms of the, just, uh, I want to remain brief, so I know I'm sure there's a lot of time for the Q&A, so the, just the other things I was going to mention in terms of the, the operational use of, of this tool, uh, which has so much potential to really helping us understand uh, development challenges. And particularly in terms of, so it seems maybe to use a bad metaphor that you have uh, this, this, this uh, in, index is a Ferrari, Right, and it's being driven to 100 uh, kilometers per hour already. So I'm just kind of thinking about adding the extra uh, 20 kilometers per hour. And so, so far you have the kind of, you know, mashup index. I'm wondering whether, to what extent it would be useful to represent as well the data in terms of shapes, right? And measure countries in terms of, uh, you know, the how well, uh, so basically the, the, the shape of, of, of the index based on those different indicators and whether the shape can help us categorize countries into different case scenarios, right, in terms of the different challenges that they have to deal with. And based on this data, looking at how uh, basically pattern, how patterns evolve over time, right, if a country that is in a particular uh, challenge historically, right, what have been the movements across the different categories, and that can help us better understand, you know, which challenges are necessary to resolve before, you know, being able to resolve other challenges, right? So that leads back to discussion on governance, but also on the whole question about um, the economic and environmental challenges, right? Is it possible to, to address them both at the same time? Or historically have countries that 
fared better in terms of environmental health challenge had to grow first before uh, sorting those issues. And um, and uh, and yeah, so basically the kind of idea of of, uh, of looking at this data multidimensionally as well, right? Because it, it is a multidimensional index, but then over time to be able to conduct a a pattern and, and movement analysis and 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 help us understand of the sequencing of, of of solving development challenges. So I think that's all for now uh, uh, on my side. But thank you very much for for a very insightful presentation and and uh, I, I really look forward to seeing the next steps of, of what's been done with this uh, uh, index by yourself, but also by others, researchers and policymakers that you know will use it and inform their their policies and research on uh, based on your data. Thank you. Thank you, Amir. And um, there are already some questions coming from Amir. So what we will do is, once we move to the Q and A, we will you will be able to to answer some of these questions. So we're now going to listen to Sabina. Thank you so much. So a very warm congratulations um, to the team at Esqua for really what I think is a, a groundbreaking report. And so I'd like to begin with a quote, um, and it is in a sense only on one of the, the several themes that are covered, um, but it's the theme of um, the democracy and, and political freedom. And see if you remember when this is from. Um, but it, it speaks about, um, sorry, just lost it. Um, We can hear you, Sabina, and we can see you. So the, the 1991 Human Development Report um, followed the 1990 launch, of course. And of course, the first chapter was on the Human Development Index and on the findings of that year and the trends. Um, but the second part of that was trying to introduce the concepts of, of human freedoms um, and really understand what these were. Um, and in 1992, the report, that second chapter, said that the purpose of human development is to increase people's range of choices. If they are not free to make those choices, the entire process becomes a mockery. So freedom is more than an idealistic goal. It is a vital component of human development. People who are politically free can take part in planning and decision-making. They can ensure that society is organized through consensus and consultation rather than dictated by an autocratic elite. It also recognizes that democratic rule can never be perfect. It needs constant injections of energy and effort, and it demands patient renewal. Um, but the uh, focus on democracy can ensure that insofar as is possible, a country's development is truly people-centered. And if you think of the human development reports that Salim led and that others have led through the year, because this is a global report, you will remember that this has been a theme that recurred. Uh, 1992 is what I read from, 1993 with focus on people's participation, 2002 on deepening democracy, um, and so on. And in 1992, they also tried to do the Human Freedom Index, but it didn't quite fly. And so one part of the novelty of the Development Challenges Index has been to put on to a solid footing this articulation of freedom. And the second component, obviously, is the environmental one, which seems so evident to us now. Um, and it is indeed you know, the focus of the 2020 Human Development Report on Human Development in the Anthropocene. Um, but also since the 1998 report on consumption, the 2007-8 on fighting climate change, 2011 on sustainability, um, there have been 2014 on sustaining progress. Um, there have been many human development reports that looked at this issue and probably each time thought about measurement. Um, but I think that really one of the one of the advantages of this Development Challenges Index is that it's taking these themes that are central to the concept of human development and then building an index 
that is admittedly imperfect, but is using very rigorous and clear and transparent method tools to try to bring these back into the conversation in a coherent way. And I think we would all agree that, that the time is ripe for that. So the first thing is just to say hats off to all of you. I think that that's really an achievement and it's something that I, um, I think that will have important, you know, into the future as, as these ideas roll out. Um, I would also say that um, the, the, I'd like to divide comments into sort of neighboring indicators and methodology. So I'll start with methodology, which is the boring bit, and then I'll get back to some of the other bits um, towards the end. But methodologically, because of course what I do is I read the paper, because um, that's what I understand best. Um, and first of all, I'd like to congratulate the authors on writing a paper that says what the index is. It's easy to follow. Based on it, I could almost you know, replicate the index precisely. And that's something that many global indices do not do. They don't give you sufficient detail to replicate the index. And that's important to engage students. It's important to invite criticism. It's important you know, so that people understand what you're doing. So that was very good. For those of you who haven't read the 219 robustness tests or the different tests for changing of weights, changing of indicators, a treatment of missing, um, let me just say that, that these tests were done and the results of the final in index in a sense have been um, assessed against them and, and those are well documented. Um, the other um, observation methodologically is that um, it's transparent about the missing indicators and it, um, that if the indicator is not available that year, then it's published what year the data are from which is again a step forward. And if it is imputed, then that is also mentioned. And that my understanding is that every country has some number for each of the indicators. If I didn't get that right, I'd, I'd love to check. Um, there are a few little technological bits. Why did imputations use Gini? Um, how do you test that against Atkinson? But these are, these are very minor things. And the last technical um, observation I would have is a little bit of a suggestion going forward that's a little bit serious and it comes from James Foster and it's very tiny but you say that indicators are standard using the regular min max formula which is the minimum you know the the minimum minus the maximum of that year's tranche of data but James Foster um, has shown that when you have a moving maximum it breaks some of the properties um, and in particular, comparisons across time are quite difficult um, and uh, interpretations uh, are, are a little bit more challenged. And so I would have a little bit of a suggestion that maybe you consider um, also having a fixed maximum um, because then that just permits interoperability across different reports and time periods rather than having to recompute all of the measures and all of the trends each year. So that would be a, a small suggestion methodologically. But I, I really enjoyed that. I think my comments are predictably on, on your neighbors. So first of all, I found it was quite interesting um, to look at how the relation, how this development challenges index related to the human development index, the social progress index, et cetera. I was interested in um, because of the emphasis in the report on conflict and observations about development challenges and conflict whether the Global Peace Index and the eight pillars of positive peace might be uh, another to engage with in a future report, a future study. Um, obviously, working on multidimensional poverty, it would be interesting to see if the human development uh, challenges component uh, tracked and just, you know, train spotting countries uh, that were labeled on your spread, spread chart, charts and looking a bit in the back. Um, there's, there's clearly a, a, a good relationship. Uh, though the years differ and so we have to interpret much more carefully. Um, but there are also other indicators, whether it's legatum prosperity or whether it's um, a, a single dimensional environment one, whether it's the um, environmentally adjusted HDI that came out in 2020. So it might be interesting in a future study, um, you know, to have a, a wider neighborhood conversation with other indicators of this type, but perhaps going beyond the scatter plot to really looking at which, which each of the indicator, which each of them 
add? What's the value added? What are the divergences? Um, I think that that uh, a little bit closer analysis would, would really do some interesting work and also having a bit of a methodological talk about data, dates, et cetera. Um, the next point, and I just have two more, um, is that uh, development challenges um, are vast. And just to contextualize this, if I look at the human development component with a health, education, and living standards, and then if you add voice and governance, and you add environment, it's some of the dimensions of the Stiglitz San Fatusi Commission, but not all. It's some of the dimensions of the Challenge Gross National Happiness Index, but not all. And so there would be other do domains, whether it's psychological well being, that could be mental health, positive, negative emotions, evaluative life satisfaction, et cetera. Um, there might be something about relationships, social isolation, um, meaningful interactions, social capital, et cetera. Maybe time use, maybe culture and the arts. Um, I'm not suggesting that these be an index that, you know, that it should be packed with all of these, but I think a recognition that actually what the Development Challenges Index does is it broadens two steps, two big steps towards a multidimensional well-being measure. And there are literatures, I think, that um, would be able to talk to that and also say, well, then what happens if we put it alongside some other exogenous indicator of, of global health or something? Um, and the last um, observation is just data, um, that this is a measure that mathematically could be disaggregated um, subnationally. And so Khaled mentioned the possibility of having national adaptations of this. Um, and especially, for example, using the Atkinson inequality adjustment means, again, you've retained subnational decomposability. And so it would be, I think, indeed, very interesting to go subnational um, in some countries to do some trials of that. Um, and a question would be, you know, are, are the data existing? Is there a call for um, some of these data to be available subnationally? Or what would you do, um, in, particularly in the governance indicators, to have um, these kind of data? But I think that that, that could be quite interesting. But if that is a little bit of a step too far, if a bit ambitious, you could also, in a sense, do a global aggregate um, and then slice and dice it, not just by country, but um, by climate, by different dimensions that you would argue the data are representative by, and, and you might be able to do that. So um, just some, some different possibilities to use the data set that you have, um, but with different groupings than the world regions, which I think are important and it's a fantastic place to start. Um, but, you know, coastal areas, landlocked areas, a, a, a small, old data democracy, you know, you could think of lots of variables where you could conflict situations where you could slice and dice this and, and see what you learn. So I know that I'm a little bit greedy. I always want more, but it's because I think that this has been a very innovative and rigorous exercise. I think it's something that's necessary. Uh, and I believe it'll have a future. And so it's perhaps a backhanded compliment, but I look forward greatly to what comes next. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Selena. Um, so I think we are now ready to take some questions from, from the audience. We already have a number of questions from our discussants, and um, you will take them uh, later. So we're going to collect some from the audience here, and I think there might be some questions uh, in the Zoom chat. I'm not sure about that, but you, you can tell us. There's one question here. Just wait for a minute. Thank you. Uh, Please identify yourself. And uh, I'm Ming. I'm a student at SOAS. Okay. Thank you. Um, at Development Study Department. <laughs> um, I have two questions, and maybe a bit specific. On the quality of education, I see that the index is about years of schooling. Is it possible also to reflect like the um, quality of uh, um, education, like what's being taught um, 
like the school, the education, do they, like the countries, do they encourage or disencourage critical thinking? Um, a second question is about uh, the governance index. Um, would it, I, I'm just thinking, would it change quickly with the change of government within a country? Would it change the index? Um, for example, if like America with the uh, Donald Trump ending, does it change the index of the gov governance index of America? Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Muskan and I'm an economic student at SOAS. I just wanted to kind of ask on why kind of the environment and health, um, so for example, the environmental impacts were so, were like only linked to health. And for example, uh, in regards to kind of like waste and air quality, and if you're trying to improve health, has it been proven that, for example, that, um, you know, uh, would improving the environment would actually improve health outcomes or was there more significant uh, indicators like access to nutritious diets and medical care. Not that we shouldn't improve the environment, but the fact that the actual impacts of the environment, um, the major impact in my opinion, and I think with most environmental scientists is not really kind of a local issue of like a factory producing waste and then the local area suffering from that, but it's more so that, uh, I mean, carbon would be released, then global warming, and then you'd have increased, you know, extreme weather patterns, for example, like the floods in Pakistan, which would actually then go on and kill millions of people. And that would happen more and more frequently. So it was just more so that um, to kind of explain the choice of why health and environment were so, uh, you know, were very you know, closely linked here, where, whereas, um, in my opinion, I'm not really qualified that they'd be better dealt with separately. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question? One question there and another there. Can you speak up a little bit? Uh, hi, I'm Noha. I'm a student at LSE. Um, I was curious, you were talking about uh, inequality, and I was curious to know how do you, not how do you measure it, but in inequality, it's important to have an intersectionality of all of the vectors affecting, intersection, uh, affecting the inequality. For example, in education, you should consider race, gender, ethnicity, and everything. However, it becomes so complex, so sometimes you need to uh, disregard some of the vectors. So how would you deal with a, with a problem like this one? Thank you. Thank you. And there was one here, Uganda. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you all for the presentation. My name is Bethena. I'm a final year PhD student at SOAS in development economics. So my question is about using challenge as the unit. So a challenge for one country may not be a challenge for another country. For example, while COVID was a global challenge, some countries had a bigger or yeah, a bigger capacity to deal with it than others. So it was less of a challenge. So I wonder how that is accounted for in this index. Thank you. Okay, shall we take this? Um, do you have any from Zoom? Yeah, there are, there are like two questions on Zoom. So Deborah um, from Nigeria is asking, <clears throat> how can good governance and, resi and a resilient economy prevent an environmental natural disorder? A case study of Nigeria who has had 450 of its 775 local governments in 36 states overtaken by rising floods in the last one month and some communi communities completely submerged underwater. And there is another question by Aidan Michael, and it is if and how women's rights is treated or addressed in this report. Thank you. I think we probably have a few further questions we can tackle. So over to you. <laughs> Don't look at me. Go ahead, Sui. Sorry. Sorry. There is one more question on Zoom. Okay. Sorry. 
Um, given the, this is by Pam, given the fundamental role of good nutrition in human development, I am surprised this is not mentioned in the index. Could this be included as a health indicator? And they are a SOAS alumni from, the, from 2007. Okay, um, well, thank you so much. I mean, this has been, uh, it's been very um, interesting. And um, I would like to, uh, first of all, thank um, Amir and Sabina for their very encouraging and fruitful remarks. Um, and um, I, I um, as, as Salim said, I mean, we, we, we know how difficult this is and we don't expect any index to be perfect, let alone one that tries to uh, really take on very complex issues and very uh, ones that are very difficult uh, to measure. I'll, I'll try to um, address some of the, the you know, f more, uh, you know, the difficult questions. And um, Salim uh, Amir, uh, sorry, uh, uh, it has mentioned uh, two major remarks, one on the issue of environmental uh, sustainability and the balance between adaptation, mitigation, consumption, production. We've had uh, lots of uh, discussions on this. We tried to the best of our ability to balance between the production and consumption. So you'll see that there is a uh, carbon emissions uh, 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 indicator is also material footprint indicator there. And then there's fundamentally your, your production system. You know, how uh, efficient is it? And we try. We one of our options was to, to try to include renewables, but the data, when you look at the you know, the kernel distribution, was really bad. I mean, so that's one of what Sabina mentioned that we had to do a lot of trials and tests uh, to to be able to include an, an indicator. And uh, when the data looked very, uh, I mean, conflict, for example, as a, even as a correlation variable, was very difficult because. Conflict is a continuous variable is not there for most countries and we only had it categorically and then it there are some major statistical challenges when you when you do this work. So it has been um, difficult, but we we've reflected all of these debates and uh, I take note of uh, Sabina's point because we reflected all of these debates and we tried as much as possible to be transparent about them in the technical background. So if you go to the technical background papers you'll see a lot of answers to, to this question. But your fundamental question, Amir, is the sequencing issue. Which of these challenges are more important? I think there was another question about that. And these challenges could be more important for one country, one region. And yes, of course, there's no doubt about that. Um, is governance, is good governance part of the definition of human development outcomes, goals, or is it a causal uh, factor? Um, I take, we take the position that it is a fundamental part of the definition of uh, human development and development at large. And I think Sabina alluded to that. And, and this is a, you know, it, it's not, it is also an enabler. It's a very important enabler, but it's also a fundamental right. And when you take that position, you have to include it in the measure. And in, in fact, that has been all along in the development of the concept, and I think, Salim can talk about the early on debates on how to uh, well, you know, operationalize the human development index. There were many chapters devoted to that issue. Right from the very start, there was a recognition that fundamentally you need to include freedoms and human rights in the very fabric of your measure. The challenge was how to do so. Uh, and it still is a major challenge because um, how do you measure governance without expert opinion? Um, and once you get into expert opinions, then how do you standardize them? Uh, so it's a difficult issue, and there's no perfect way to do it. We try to the best of our ability, uh, but, uh, but of course the sequencing issue is, is fundamentally important at the national level and at the regional level. So I agree with you on that, um, that there are some regions for which the sequence would matter, and of course a developed region is very different than the developing region. So, um, moving on to Sabina, thank you, Amir, very much. Moving on to Sabina, um, the data could be disaggregated at the sub-national level. Uh, that would be a dream. <laughs> I know with the MPI, that's uh, Sabina's main 
one of the best, uh, um, you know, um, uh, slides that Sabina likes to show is when you disaggregate the multidimensional poverty index at the district or even village level in some cases. Um, I wish that we could do that, um, but you would have to then think about these indicators. You'd probably have to retailor the index uh, to country specifics in order to do that, and that's something that we're open for. But it's a, it would be also an encouragement to if, if countries can design surveys that would take that into account. So it's, it's potentially doable, I think, but it would depend on the country uh, specifics. So, um, when we have a moving max, uh, consider the fixed max, yes, that has been also part of the debate. You know, how do you fix the max? And the mins are usually more easier, but the maximum values of an index is usually very controversial. You know? What is the maximum, you know, uh, on life expectancy? Is it, uh, you know, the observed maximum? Well, we know that there's progress historically, and we expect that progress to continue, even at a more slower pace, because we're reaching the, the limit, unless some kind of technological revolution happens that makes us live a decade longer on average. So these have all been discussed, and we tend to leave. And we follow the Human Development Index in their approach on this. So, um, you know, you basically leave some room for improvement. So you're expected improvement in the future, so you don't have to go back and change uh, to change over time. Neighbors um, uh, and, and, you know, correlations with the Global Peace Index and the MPI and the the social progress index, which is we're very highly correlated with that, and that has been, I think you're right, we need to go way beyond the scatter plot discussion and look at uh, this um, um, uh, with more analytical insight. Um, and even design, and that's why I showed new indices that can speak to um, the, 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 the policy recommendations, because whenever you're dealing with the composite index and you want to propose policies, you also need to think like the multidimensional inequality challenge. Um, if we know that uh, inequality is a major issue, and it's definitely one of the major recommendations we would like to have, and of course there was a question about gender and how it's treated in this report, and it's, it's indirectly part of your governance uh, indicators, because when you're good on governance, you're probably going to have better, uh, you know, uh, uh, gender uh, outcomes. But that, we were, that wasn't very satisfactory for us. So when we tried to go for the inequality uh, proposal, which we're working on right now, we specifically accounted for gender uh, inequalities. We specifically accounted for group inequalities uh, and vertical inequalities between the rich and poor. And inequalities in wealth, which we had a whole a section of working on it because we think fundamentally that is inequalities in wealth that is the major driver of inequalities and in opportunities and the studies have shown that if when you decompose uh, you know your, your d index or the similarity index you look at the contributors of inequality of opportunities it's the wealth of uh, the household and the uh, occupation and, and, and uh, characteristics of the head of households are usually the most important drivers in, in most countries across most in, indicators. So, um, but, but let me say that um, there are aspects that we'll never be able to, and I, I take your point about the issue, issues like culture and, 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 and happiness even. Uh, and when I was asked the question, you know, well, you know, what if you're living in a country, in, in Sudan, for example, this was a Sudanese uh, a colleague, friend of mine, he said, you know, we're pretty happy. You know, we don't have access to electricity all of the time, we have this, but when I compare my lifestyle to the ones that my colleagues have, uh, are having in London or New York, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I'd rather be in this situation than, you know, being overburdened with debt working uh, 13 hours a day. And that's true, and, and, and we, there's no, pretension here that we're measuring real happiness and that's something that uh, we're, we're basically looking at uh, you know more um, quantifiable and, uh, and and very specific aspects of development but uh, and this is by the way my professor Galel Amin um, well-known Egyptian sociologist that was his fundamental critique of human development as an index and human development as an approach is that it doesn't really account for for happiness in, in the true sense of the term, or 
even going beyond that spirituality. I mean, that's something else. We're not dealing with this in this, uh, in this index. So, uh, very quickly, um, men, uh, quality uh, of education, years of schooling, uh, critical thinking, um, that's very tough, of course. You, you don't really uh, know how to do that. But if you do well on, on international test scores, and we've taken that from the TIMS uh, and other uh, international test scores, usually they factor in critical thinking in the way that they measure. Uh, of course, there are many problems in the way that you do that and how you can standardize across regions and the World Bank themselves are, admit, admit to these problems. But um, it's, it's there implicitly. It's, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's a difficult one, but, uh, but I think it's, it's part of the measure of the quality adjusted uh, education uh, challenge index. Uh, um, when uh, countries regress on uh, governance, is it factored in? Yes. Uh, and I think if you look at the rank of the, uh, not because of Donald Trump, but yeah, <laughs> specifically, but when you look at the rank of uh, United States uh, yeah. compared to uh, its rank on human development index, you will see that there is a, a regression, and for a few other countries, for various reasons. Uh, and, um, and, and, and that's, again, part of the, uh, the, the value added, I think, of, of this uh, indicator, is that, uh, this index, is that not all developed countries are the same. There are major differences uh, in governance systems and governance outcomes between uh, Nordic countries and European countries and, of course, North, North America. Um, I very quickly... Um, a challenge for one country, I think I've addressed that. Uh, uh, women rights, I've, I think I've, I've addressed that as well. Fundamental role. Uh, I think I'll stop here. I think, oh, the nutrition, uh, the nutritional one. And the link between health and uh, environment. Okay, so the link between health and, and the environment has been deliberate in the design of the index. Okay. So we looked at healthy life expectancy. That's our main indicator because that's the, the philosophy is you discount uh, your life expectancy by quality of life. And here the healthy life expectancy indicator uh, does that already. But then what are the fundamental drivers of or what are the determinants of healthy life uh, expectancy? That's the Yale index. And it was actually designed to answer that question. So these are the, the weights of, of that particular uh, dimension were selected in exactly the same proportion as they are in the Yale index, in the environmental performance index, because of that. So you can argue that health has a much more, uh, implicitly, much more weight in the DCI uh, than in uh, the HDI. Um, so that would be my answer to your, to your question. Um, well, let me stop here. I think I've addressed most Thank of the you. questions. Salim, do you want to add? I just want to make some general comments. Uh, one is that a concept is always broader and larger than the measurement. There is not a single measure, particularly in social science, which can claim that we have measured that particular comes concept 100%. That's not true in physical science. If we say that temperature of the room is 79, it is 79. Mm -hmm. It's neither 78, it's neither seven, or 77. So therefore, one has to remember that the index, whether it is a composite index or an indicator, what it is trying to measure cannot capture the totality of the concept there. So the development challenge index, there is no presumption or arrogance on our part that the index completely 100% measures the development challenges. That's number one. Number two is that I know, I don't know how many of you are from statistics, but statisticians have a habit of if they have any numbers, they just want to put it into a kind of an index. But remember that every sustainable, robust index has a very strong analytical framework. The Human Development Index has an analytical framework. The Multidimensional Poverty Index also has a very strong analytical framework. 
So therefore, when you look at the development challenge index, don't get bogged down in the index itself or too excited about the index itself. Try to find out what is the kind of the analytical thinking that has gone into coming up with that index. Because if you don't do that, then you miss the totality of the picture. So that's the second thing. Third thing is about the composite index. Should every indicator be thrown into the composite index to make it a kind of a salad? Or we should try to make a composite index on some of the strategic indicators and then keep the rest of the indicators as a kind of a dashboard or as a kind of a table so that they would be complementary to the development challenge index. I think in future, as we are listening to you and others, there is a demand of putting everything into development index. That's not going to happen and that's not going to do the index any kind of justice. Because the more you throw into the composite index, the less it becomes robust and it also loses its predictive power. So therefore, one of the things that we have to do in future that yes, this is the minimum basics we'll put into the development index. There will be other indicators which we will try to put it either in terms of a dashboard or in some forms so that they can be um, complementary to that. I think Sabina has made two very important points. The first one is, it is absolutely necessary as much as possible to disaggregate the index. Because as we all know, that an index, an average index, masks all kinds of disparities or differences. And you know that uh, famous joke that half of your body may be in the oven, the other half is in the refrigerator, and on average, you'd be comfortable. <laughs> so therefore, I think it is absolutely important to disaggregate because that will also unmask it. And disaggregated indices are the major instrument to the policy makers because then they know what, is need, what needs to be done in what area, what region wants to, or what countries wants to uh, have different kind of treatment in terms of policies. The other point uh, that Sabina has uh, made, and I think we have to think about it, we thought about it in HDI and we tried to fix it, is that if your max and minimum are observed, then your scale is changing all the time. So whenever you are measuring something, the changes, is it because of real changes have happened no. or because of your scale has changed? Now, in terms of the minimum, as Khalid point, pointed out, there is less problem. In terms of maximum also, you can make some assumptions. Life expectancy, the way we dealt with HDI, Suppose the life expectancy average or the highest in Norway is now 85. If we say that the maximum of life expectancy would be 90 in 10 years, what is the harm? So using certain subjective notion, you can fix that maximum. But as Sabina has pointed out, that unless you fix that problem of maximum and minimum, your measurement actually will be a little bit faulty, particularly when you are trying to compare it over time or you are trying to compare it across countries. So that would be something that um, we have to deal with. My final point is that there are certain things which cannot be measured and which should not be measured. I love my child. I challenge you, give me a mathematical formula that can re really represent, or number, or indicator, that can really represent that fundamental statement that I love my children. So therefore, there are certain things which actually we should talk about it, 
we should highlight about it, but don't put it in kind of a measurement or index actually, because then you lose the strength, the depth of that particular concept. For example, the whole question of culture, how you're trying to measure it. The whole question of um, the, uh, uh, the context of a particular country in terms of heritage, how can you measure it? So I think it is very important to mention them, to set the context of development challenges and measurement of development outcomes, but don't try to put all of those things which are very qualitative, which are very subjective, into some kind of a quantifiable measurement. Because then we lose the perspective and we also lose the, um, the context of it. My final one point, be very clear in your mind, what are you trying to measure? Because in many cases I have seen the things that people want to measure and what they actually measure are not the same thing. So be very careful and very clear what you want to measure. I think once you do that, the measurement will, may not be perfect, but the measurement would be useful and meaningful. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to give the floor to Natasha for any final, any additions to these comments? Is she there? She has the camera off. Huh? She has her camera off. Oh, okay. Not there. Oh. Hi, sorry, I couldn't hear the last thing. Yeah, no, we just wanted to give you the, the, the floor if you want to add any comments to, to the responses or those questions. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a few things. Let me just close the door really quick. Everyone can hear me okay. Um, I was just going to comment on whether or not the change in government changes the index. I completely agree what Khaled already said. It, it does impact the index. Um, it, it can impact it for the better or for the worse. I mean, we think of the common example of, of Donald Trump, um, but also you have a positive example of what happened in Ecuador after Korea left office and Lenin Moreno took over and um, re-implemented some democratic reforms. Uh, so, so it can really go up or down, and, and I think that the, the index can cover these things. Um, I just had a quick comment on the good governance and preventing an environmental disaster. Uh, it, it, it is really critical to have good governance in preventing environmental disasters um, and, and all kinds of um, natural disasters as well. There are really good studies on the importance of good governance in preventing death tolls with earthquakes. Um, good governance, like for example, in the Cayman Islands has been incredibly important in curbing the death toll from hurricanes. Um, and, and we have examples of uh, all kinds of work for fl uh, flood mitigation um, and dealing with all kinds of uh, disasters where good governance is, is really, really critical. Um, I mean, that's all I think my question, the questions that were addressed about governance addressed. I, I, I do agree with um, the comments from the discussants. Um, and I just will address what um, Amr had said about that relationship between development and governance. And it, it is um, one that we uh, have discussed quite a bit. And, and we've, as we've said, um, and I hope where I agree with Khaled, how important governance is to development, uh, but we see how important it is to, to have the will to implement good governance and, and how other things can, can follow. And, and a lot of this is just affected by a, a lack of will um, to, to adhere to what we know is good governance. Um, and, and, and when this happens, you know, we, we do see that there can be a, a lot of positive um, long-term impacts to, to development. And that's all from me. Thank you, Natasha. 
Okay, I think uh, it's already quarter past seven, so I'm just going to uh, close the event with a few remarks of my own, if you don't mind. I think it's, it, it was a really enjoyable uh, event, uh, and a very, very important topic. And I just wanted to make a, you know, a few final comments drawing from the different interventions in, in, um, in the launch. Um, I think it is actually quite remarkable that a, a report of these characteristics, a global report with a new global index comes from a regional office in the UN, and it's a testament of the, the technical quality of, of the team that you, you managed to assemble, and also all the people who've contributed uh, um, from outside. Um, um, it's, I think it's, it's a really major achievement also, knowing your budget constraints. Um, when I was coming to, to the launch, uh, I bumped into a colleague who was asking me, you know, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going to this launch event on a, on a new development index. And the colleagues say, oh, another multidimensional index, rather skeptically. Um, and I think, you know, this question has been raised here as well. And I think, you know, some of your responses have been um, really useful in terms of managing this kind of debate, because we have it in class here. We, we constantly dealing with the issue of, you know, how do we measure development? We have all these multiple indices, which one is the, is the best one and, and why? Uh, I think what, what's clear is that there is no arrogance in the process, as Salim uh, puts it, and uh, this is part of a process, and every index and every effort really contributes in one way or another to, to new insights and, and new ways of understanding uh, questions of measurement, but also broader conceptual, um, big conceptual debates on, on, on development. I think what really matters is that everyone understands, as Salim pointed out, what is being measured and why, what is the analytical and normative framework that underpins these different indices and therefore being able to use different indices according to the way they've been uh, formulated. Um, some might ask whether is this going to replace the Human Development Index at some point? Uh, probably not, maybe yes, but I think one um, uh, comment that Sabina made uh, in her intervention um, was quite pertinent on, on this question, which is actually what we need is a little bit more of a dialogue between the different indices. Different indices uh, do different jobs, and they contribute in different ways. Can we you know, do sort of cluster analysis of these different indices? In what ways they, do they contribute and why? And I think one major contribution in this particular index is the opportunity that it gives to explore the dynamic interactions between the, the different dimensions that you have in the index. So the questions that Amir was raising on you know, how governance, progress, in terms of governance indicators is linked to the environmental challenges, to, to income challenges, um, and, and also whether are we in a world of preconditions of development or do we mostly talk about co-evolution of, of you know, changes in these different uh, indicators. So I think this opens up this kind of conversation, which I think is central uh, for us teaching students about measuring development, but also more broadly in the in international development community. I think you know some challenges that you would probably face for you know, anyone who works on indices, uh, and I always raise this issue, is uh, raw data. Um, the sources of data, unfortunately, are uneven. Uh, you will have very high quality data for some countries and low quality data for other countries. This will not be uh, equally distributed across dimensions and indicators, and this is the kind of challenges that everyone working on indices will, will face, and I think that's, that's one that is, I see as a major challenge. And also, uh, remembering our experience with the Mo Ibrahim Index in, in the context of Africa, and the reactions of governments when they don't like where they rank, and they don't like you know, what the index is saying in terms of progress or lack of progress, and I think that's, that's another one that might arise in the future. But thank you very much for this presentation, for the report, for the index, and for being here and choosing SOAS to launch your report. We're really grateful. Thank you.